you have bestowed upon us. We thank you especially for the gift of faith that you have given. Help it to always grow stronger in you. You made this lesson tonight. Help us to go to know your mysteries a little better and to enter into them more fully. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy Week liturgy. Before going into Holy Week liturgy, let me ask this question. Let's see how much scripture people know. Uh, how long was Jesus' public ministry? Okay, three years. Three years. You know why you think that? So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Somebody told you. Well, it could be a correct answer. It comes from the Gospel of John. John's Gospel mentions three different Passovers. That's why we think his public ministry was three years. But if we look at the other Gospels, we really have no sense of time whatsoever, with one exception. Uh, Mark's Gospel, the whole thing could have been a matter of years. It could have been extended over years. Where we do know the time is when we get to Holy Week. Mark's Gospel starts to spell out every day. Jesus enters Jerusalem on the first day of the week, Sunday. Looks around and then he leaves town. Comes back the next day. Cleanses the temple. Leaves town again. Comes back the, the next day. He had cursed a fig tree in the morning. Now it's withered and they have a conversation about that. So we can pinpoint each of the days of what's going on in Jesus' life in all the Gospels because time slows down this way. And as we go through the liturgies, I'll cover what at least Mark's Gospel says happens on each day. It's a little bit different in John's Gospel. That I just covered. So, Sunday. It is called both Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday. Jesus enters Jerusalem and he looks around. During the, the Mass, every Mass will begin with a sort of procession where we will have a blessing of the palm branches and we will read the Gospel about the entry into Jerusalem. Uh, and then... During the normal part of Mass, where we have the, the Gospel read, we read another Gospel. This is the Passion. This is the longest one of the year. Uh, well, thankfully, this year we have the shortest Passion, Mark's Gospel. But it, it'll be the longest reading that we have on any given Sunday. Yeah, plan on that Mass being at least an hour, even when I do. It's hard to, to shorten the Passion. The custom is to stand during the Passion. There's a part where we also kneel. But because of how long we're standing, if you feel the need to sit down, go ahead and sit down. So, Monday of Holy Week, Jesus curses the fig tree which he then later explains as being a sign of uh, the, the Jewish faith. So the Israelite people and the faithfulness to God, they have not borne fruit from God. Um, and then he goes to the temple and throws out the money changers. John's Gospel, that cleansing of the temple happened much earlier. Second chapter. But the Synoptic Gospels all put it in Holy Spirit. The Mass of the day is just a simple daily Mass as celebrated on um, any other day. The Gospel will be about the dinner with Lazarus and Mary. And Mary comes and washes Jesus' feet with this ointment. Jesus complains. Uh, Jesus says that line before you will have that with you, but not me. Tuesday, Peter notices that the fig tree has withered. And then the rest of the day spent 
teaching in the temple area. Where is the prophecy of the destruction of the temple and the end? The mass of that day is the gospel where Jesus prophesies about his own betrayal. The Diocese of Toledo will have the Prisma Mass. Traditionally, this was a Mass that would be celebrated Thursday morning, but because of how it's celebrated, a lot of dioceses have moved it to an earlier day in the week so that more priests can participate. Um, the bishop presides, and all the priests of the diocese should gather around him and could celebrate the Mass. It'll be held in the cathedral in Toledo. Uh, at one point during the Mass, the priests will all renew their, their promise. The bishop will sort of do it um, without using the same formula because the bishop asks us to. He doesn't ask himself. But then there's an exhortation for all of us to certainly pray for the bishop. Then the bishop proceeds to bless the three holy oils that we use throughout the year. The three oils are the oil of catechumens, the oil of the sick, and the sacred chrism. The oil of catechumens, those of you who have not been baptized, it would be good to be anointed at least once before your baptism. We can do that at the Holy Saturday practice, but if you can't be there, let me know so we can arrange another time. The oil of the sick is used for the sacrament, the anointing of the sick. And then the sacred chrism. This is a perfumed oil. The, this is seen almost as kind of a presence of Christ, and it's treated with more reverence than we would the other oil. The oil of the sick, I carry it on my keychain. Never know when I'm going to encounter somebody who needs the, the anointing of the sick. But when it comes to the sacred chrism, preference is that we don't treat them like that. That one we keep in the church and then we take it twice. Um, the sacred chrism is used for baptism, confirmation, and then the ordinations of priests and bishops. <coughs> If you'd like to attend the the Chrism Mass, Tuesday of Holy Week, 11 a.m. at the cathedral. Everybody's welcome. I think the diocese is going to have a vacation this year. Did <coughs> any of you receive an invite to the Chrism Mass? So maybe they only sent it out to people who gave to the annual chapel. <laughs> Did any of you give to the annual Catholic appeal? <laughs> and you then get the prism cut. Yeah. I wonder then how they made the selection. I got one and my mother got one. <laughs> Wednesday is also called Spy Wednesday. Because this is the day that Judas goes to the priest and makes the agreement to betray Jesus. Uh, the mass of that day is, uh, oh no, it's dinner with the anointing of the feet. What we had the gospel on Monday actually seems to take place on Wednesday. Um, the gospel from the mass is about Jesus going to the priest. And in the evening, we'll have a special service here called Tenebrae. Not every parish does it. So. This, is, this is because as we go through the next three days, there is a prayer that's called the Divine Office, Liturgy of the Hours. How many have heard of it? Okay. It's a prayer that all the priests have taken promises to say. In monasteries and convents, their life revolves around saying this prayer. And there's seven times, six times a day that the monks and the sisters will get together and, and pray. 
the two hinges, if you will, the two most important are morning and evening prayer. But as we enter the, the next three days, what we call the Trinity, evening prayer is omitted by those who celebrate these liturgies. So most monasteries and religious communities will not have evening prayer until Easter Sunday. So this is the last one. Last evening prayer said before entering these three days. And it's usually a service that then adds a little bit with uh, the Book of Lamentations. Some of the, the Book of Lamentations is either read or actually chanted. And as they go through the various parts, all the lights are gradually extinguished. So there's only one light left, the Easter candle. That's processed out so the church is in darkness. Then a gray means darkness or shadow. Thursday, Holy Thursday, also called Monday, Thursday. Don't ask me why. Does anybody else know why it was called Monday, Thursday? You have to look up the meaning of that word. Um, of course, Holy Thursday is uh, the day that Jesus gathers with his apostles in the upper room, and they have the Last Supper. Um, there is no morning mass over the next few days. Traditionally, the morning mass would have been the Christmas. Then there is the evening mass, the mass of the Lord's Supper. That must take place in the evening. It cannot be held earlier during the day. Um, and this begins what we call the Triduum. It's a Latin word that basically means three in one day. The uh, Mass of the Lord's Supper will pretty much be recognized as a normal Mass with the addition of the washing of the feet. That is what the Gospel that we hear is about. And after, at the end of the Mass, there is no dismissal given. Over the next few days, I will not say to the congregation, go in peace, because it's seen as one liturgy. Not three. So the Mass will end with a procession where here we will go in around outside usually, weather permitting, and come into the church or come into the gym where we will reserve the, the Blessed Sacrament. It's a time then for people to come and pray in the presence of Christ to, to keep watch with them. A number of churches have a custom of trying to visit seven churches during that time. Spend a little bit of time in prayer. So there will be a group I know from St. Thomas going around to seven different chapels. They usually come to ours last. But close to home and closer to their bed. Um, Mike would know what time they usually get here, but it's closer to midnight when they do it. Some cultures I know will keep the tradition of trying to visit as many Catholic churches during the whole week as possible. Time permitting, I'll tell you that story. If you come into the church on Holy Thursday, you will see that the tabernacle is empty. No Eucharist kept there that day. Holy water pots will also be empty. We have holy water until we have Easter. And, um, and all the bread that we consecrate that night is to get us through also Good Friday. Of course, some of it being the door to church, and then it's brought over for the Good Friday liturgy. Of course, Good Friday, that's the day Jesus is condemned and crucified. Um, there is no Mass at it. The Good Friday liturgy is not a Mass. What is a Mass at that? Isn't it the singing of the Eucharist? 
Well, we'll have communion. But it's not enough. Well, it's, it's, that was a, the word. I can't say it. Try again. The music is, it, it makes it a mess when you touch the cradle. Right. But we have the long, Eucharistic <laughs> prayer that everybody's kneeling for. That is what makes it a mess. Otherwise, if you go to some of the churches, if you come on Good Friday, you'll have communion, but it's not a Mass. If you're still finishing the Mass that you started Thursday, you send you home. So, during the Good Friday liturgy, there's a lot of silence. We come in in silence. There's no music at that point. And we have the reading of the Passion. This time it's from John's Gospel. On Sunday it was from one of the other Gospels. Good Friday it's always from John. And then there's the solemn intercession. These are lengthy petitions that uh, are usually chanted. At least the introductory part is chanted. And we start by praying for the church, and we eventually go through ten of them, and we work down to uh, praying for anyone who needs it. Hope gets mentioned, those who don't believe get mentioned, those who... The Jewish people have a petition. Um, the cantor will chant the first part, then say, let us kneel. We'll kneel for a period of silent prayer for that intention. Then the cantor will say, let us stand. And then I say a prayer after each one. Then going through ten petitions, and then a prayer after each petition. There's a prayer. Um, then we have the veneration of the cross. The cross you come to church this Sunday, you'll see that all the statues and crucifixes will be covered. On Good Friday, the cross will be unveiled. It's a custom to venerate the cross. To come forward, and most, I think, will kiss the cross. Kiss the cross, usually. Some will just genuflect to the cross. Usually, when we genuflect in the Catholic Church, Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ. But on Good Friday, it's a custom to actually genuflect to the crucifix. So the crucifix will be there for his adoration. And the service will conclude with Holy Communion. Notice that it goes much quicker than it does on a Sunday because the whole day is the Our Father. And then behold the Lamb of God, and we'll sign the peace. We can normally do at a Mass. There's no blood of Christ. We're not permitted to keep that overnight. So it's just the body of Christ that is consumed. And afterwards, we leave in silence. No dismissal again. Father Tom, and there is no adoration on Friday? There, I always have to double check the rules. Even um, some places will offer confessions on Good Friday. But taking communion, I think, to other people is only permitted for those who are And then on only Saturday, it's only permitted for those who are dying. Saturday, again, no morning mass. The Easter vigil, again, is a mass unlike any other. Expect it to be two and a half hours. Is that what it was last year? It's closer to three. <laughs> well, a lot depends on the number of baptisms. That's true. The, uh, yeah, this year, there will be a lot. So, um, it begins outside. We'll have a fire out here on a, a 
outside and we bless the fire and then we prepare the Easter can. Oh. <coughs> you know what the Easter can are? Anita, you know where it is. How about you go grab it? Let's take it out of the stand. Be careful, the top's heavy. So, um, this is a candle that we do once a year, and we use it up until the next Easter. Uh, it's used all during the Easter season, and then it's used for any of the sacraments, especially baptism. It's also used at funerals, up there at the head of the coffin. And So the candle comes to us a little bit ornate, much taller. It's burned down probably well over a foot over the year. Um, but the, with the blessing of the fire, there's also the preparation of the candle, which is marking the cross with incense pegs going in to represent the five wounds of Jesus but also marking time. Notice that it has what last year was, 2023. New one will say 2024. So uh, the custom with these little pegs here. <laughs> is that a grain of incense would be included on these little pegs that go into the mark of the cross. So that candle won't get that far done. And the, the other problem that we would run into is we would have a mess if we got that far. Because of how the follower is hitting these things. So usually I say a parishioner will cut the candle into smaller pieces and I'll burn them usually by saying now, putting them in a sleeve without the bomb. And I'll go down. But often when it gets to this ornate stuff, sometimes that ornate stuff isn't really wax. It catch fire. That's our time. So we have the blessing of the candle, and then we process into the church in darkness. Uh, gradually, everybody who's been baptized will have a taper candle that will be lit. Those who have not been baptized, well, you're not yet the light of Christ. When you get baptized, then you will get the candle. Then we come to the liturgy of the Word. Um, the Liturgy of the Word, this is probably the longest part of the Mass because we do at least five readings. And most of these readings are lengthy, except for the Gospel, which is fairly short. The, uh, there's an option of doing up to nine readings. So I, the custom at St. Aloysius has been to go in the middle. So that will probably take about an hour because each reading will be followed by a psalm that gets sung, and then it's followed by a prayer. Then after that, we have the rites of initiation, where we begin with um, a litany of saints and blessing of the water. At the blessing of the water, the Easter candle is dunked into the water. <coughs> sign that Christ has entered the water. Um, the baptisms are going to then be followed by everybody else doing their baptism. This is where all of you about not having the candles earlier come into play because now you have a candle that you got in your baptism, and you have the job of going around and lighting everybody else's candle so they can renew their baptismal promises with the, the lit candle. 
And when I sprinkle them with holy water, I get to see how many candles I can knock out. <laughs> We'll put you through the practice. If you go through the practice once, and then you just keep an eye on me, we'll guide you through. Uh, a friend in seminary made a comment that liturgy is medicine. This is one of those where it's Oil on the floor. Get yeah. a half wax, strip it all over. Yeah. Um, Let me get it all first. That's the guys. <laughs> then, uh, then of course there would be confirmation. That takes place for those who've just been baptized, and a few other people, those who are. Already baptized for joining the Catholic Church to be confirmed, and, um, and then uh, yeah, after the confirmation, it's pretty much mass as normal. Then, so we have the first communion. Those who just entered the church will be the first ones to make their first communion, and then everybody else comes forward. Bath as usual, and here finally is where I give a dismissal. Be days after the three of them are done. Any questions? Yeah, did you <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, Sunday, of course, Easter Sunday, he had risen, Alleluia. Here's to Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter. Depending on which gospel we read, all of this seems to go on in one day. The disciples on the road to Emmaus, the apostles, at least ten of them, because Judas would have exited the stage at this point. Apparently Thomas wasn't there at that first day. Um, according to John's gospel, what we celebrate over 50 days, Easter, Ascension, Sunday, be Thursday, and Pentecost all happen on the same day. Luke is the one that spreads it out over 50 days. But in, in John's Gospel, excuse me, you'll recall that he says to Mary Magdalene, don't touch me. Remember why? It ascended to the Father. But then when he appears to the apostles in the upper room, he's saying, touch me. So it seems that he had ascended in that. And then he says, he breathes on the apostles and tells them to receive the Spirit. So that seems to be Pentecost also on that same day. So did, did Jesus actually ascend then? Well, there is this element where after, in John's Gospel, he will appear a number of times after this. So they apparently received the Spirit, they apparently, uh, he's ascended, but he's making these appearances. In Luke's Gospel, where you have the ascension taking place 40 days later, no. he doesn't come back except for... He comes back one other time, but that's when he appears to Paul on the road to Damascus. Oh, okay, yeah. All right. There's Holy Week in 30 minutes. 
Besides what I mentioned here, there's also a uh, bias custom of doing the station with the cross. So we will offer those on Good Friday. They're kind of a meditation on the, uh, the steps, if you will, from uh, Jesus' cadet, that's the first station, to put in the, the good um, Some of this is clearly in the scriptures. Other of it is pious stories that have been handed down. For example, uh, one of the stations, Jesus meets his mother at sharing the cross. Uh, that's not in any of the Gospels. Of course, we know Mary was there. It is in the Gospels. It was at the foot of the cross when he died. Face to face encounter on the road. Uh, the story of Veronica. Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. That is also not in any of the Gospels. Um, the story is that she wiped the face of Jesus as he's carrying the cross, and then an image of his face was left on the cross. Uh, we have the cross. It was kept in the Vatican. Some believe that it's not so much Veronica who wiped the face, but it might have been one of the burials of Jesus. Recall John's Gospel talks about two different crosses. One that was not where the other one was. So, so one of these may be that cloth that's in the Vatican, and the other one might be what's known as the shroud. Of course, a lot of about those two. Uh, yeah. Other events in the stations of the cross, Jesus meets the women and the children, that is in the gospel. That's in Luke's gospel. Simon helps Jesus carry the cross, that is in one of the gospels. So some of them you do find in the Bible, some you don't. Go to Cincinnati. There is a custom on Good Friday to do the stairs. Anybody here how hip in Cincinnati is? The stairs start at the Ohio River and then we go all the way up to uh, Mount Adams. There's a Catholic church on top of Mount Adams overlooking Mount Adams. People will find these stairs on Good Friday. And Carry the cross, and then when they get to the top, they get up, and they get to the confession. There are priests up there all day doing it. Sounds like a trouble. Any questions? I was going to tell you a story about the uh, custom of visiting churches on. Uh, Week. And it seems this is more of a uh, Mediterranean culture. Some of the Italians here that have heard Spanish and Spanish. I haven't heard of the Irish or German. Uh, but, uh, but before I get to the story of the Holy Thursday, or this family that went around to different churches in Toledo, uh, let me back up and tell you about Cario. How many of you have been to Cario? There's a large church there that's called the Basilica of Our Lady of Consolation. Basilica is a honorary title given to Catholic churches by the Pope. Because of the kind of church it is, and because it's a place that draws people from all over. St. Aloysius, get that title, want to be big enough, and two, we're not drawing people to actually just come to St. Aloysius because the miracles happen here, which is exactly what happened down in Perry. 
the uh, miracle that took place in 1875 with the statue of Our Lady of Consolation, inspired all these pilgrims to go there over the years. <coughs> a uh, family from Mexico moved into the Toledo area in the 1930s, and uh, had kids, if I recall. No job, the depression, they're struggling, but they had faith. So the parents make arrangements. They hear about Carrie. They make arrangements for somebody to watch their children. And they proceed down to Carrie from Toledo. Apparently, he even slept in the church a couple of days. Most of the script was either hitchhiking or on foot. This is the 30s, and they didn't have the vehicle themselves. So after a few days of praying and caring, they return home, they get home, and the lady who was watching the kids said a strange man, a man dressed strangely, I should say, but a man dressed strangely came by and bought all this food. The house was full of food. The man said, you can tell the, the parents when they return, they don't have to worry. So, a um, little bit later, he gets a letter in the mail from the city of Toledo. His English wasn't that good. He couldn't quite understand the letter. He takes it to a neighbor, and the neighbor's explaining it, or the neighbor's first reading it, and as he's reading it, the neighbor's saying, I don't understand. The letter from the city of Toledo was offering him a job with the letter. The man couldn't understand why here a recent immigrant is getting this city job and other people are losing their jobs during the Depression. But sure enough, he had the job with the water department. And uh, comes to Holy Third or comes to Holy Week. They're visiting the churches and they go to one of these churches and the kids start getting start to point and say, that's the man who brought us the food. His father got mad. They were getting excited at church and took them out. He scolded them. And he said, we've been in so many Catholic churches this week, and every one of them has a statue of St. Joseph. What do you need to say? That's the man. True story, at least from a couple sources. But yeah, so good customs to keep during Holy Week. And also, besides uh, a trip to Cincinnati through the stairs at some point, getting to Gary is a must. -see. The basement of the church has uh, a number of artifacts related to the miracles over the Questions. Does somebody know how to stop the streaming? No? Okay. Let me stop the streaming and go back to those announcements that I was doing at the beginning. <laughs>